Well, ladies, it's great to be here, and it's great uh, to uh, see you all, and uh, that you have got a hunger for God, because you could have had a good hunger this morning for the beach or for somewhere else, but you came to hear the word of the Lord. And I've been praying uh, from a new that I was going to be doing this uh, conference that the Lord would give me very clear, definite word for the meetings, because anybody can preach a sermon. Anybody. You can. Maybe you thought you couldn't, but you can. But you have to really get into that place with God where you know what God is saying for the meeting. It has to become a living word. It can be a written word, but we want it to become a living word. So in the light of that, we'll just have a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we say thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you speak to us through your word. We thank you that you are a living God. We praise you that you loved us unto dying for us. We thank you, Lord, that there hasn't been a moment in time past or in time or even in eternity that your heart and mind and thoughts hasn't been upon us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have got a plan and a purpose for every single one in this gathering together today. And we pray, Lord, that right now that you will let us hear from heaven. That's our desire, Lord, when we come to your word, that we'll see beyond the sacred page, we'll see thee, Lord. And we pray that you will give us anointed eyes, that we might gaze into that other world and have visions of Christ. And so, Lord, let us hear your voice. Let us feel your touch. Let us know your nearness. And grant it today that our hearts will burn within us because we had a meeting with a living God. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, I believe that in this day and age, what our world really needs is prophets, people that will hear the word of God and go out and proclaim it. We need those today. Well, my theme is uh, I'm going to be speaking on two special prophets today. One is Elijah and one is Elisha. Now, those who were in Cookstown on Monday night, you just keep quiet. Uh, because they told me they were coming. They must have, they, I said, well, you can come to the second meeting because the first meeting you get in the same dish. Well, <laughs> and they came to the first meeting, so I, I trust the Lord will bless, really bless it to them this time. Patterns for living. There's things in the Word of God that we need to take on board our lives and allow God to work them in. And what God works in, we need to work out. And so that is a pattern God gives them to us in order to live. Now, the Christian life, for many, is an up-and-down life. Up and down. One minute they're way up in the, in the mountain, and that's good. God gives us revelation up there. But we always have to come down the mountain because we were made for planet Earth and we need to get our feet down here. But Elijah wasn't only an up-and-down man. He also was an in-and-out man. He went in for service. He stood before the Lord. He went in for orders, and he went out for service. He went in. You will read again and again that Elijah stood before the Lord. Now, why did he stand before the Lord? He stood before the Lord to hear what God had to say to him. And then he went out to do and to perform what God said to him. Now, I want to take a short reading, and that's from James uh, chapter 5. And uh, just this one little verse, it says, Eli, verse 17 of uh, 
chapter 5 in James and verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So here was a man who was a man of prayer. He prayed. I, I trust that every one of us here prays. But I trust also that you wait to hear what God is going to say to you, and you respond. You see, our God is a living God. When you start to speak to someone, you expect them to speak back to you. Now, you'll never get to know a person who does not speak. You never really get to know them. If they're in themselves and they don't say anything. That's why everybody knows me. I never shut up. So you give out, you say, and then the person responds. Then you get to know that person, and you get to know them really well. God wants you to know him more than anything else in the world. He wants you to know them. The heathen have got gods, but their gods do not speak to them, do not respond to them, do not say things to them. So they, God is somebody that's an idol. That's all it is, an idol. A God who is no God. But our God is the creator of heaven and earth. We don't worship a different God than Abram and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Elijah and all these men. We worship the same God, not a different God. It's the same God, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible. That's the God we worship. That's the God we pray to. That's the God we get to know. That's the God who died for us. So Elijah was a man of prayer, and he prayed earnestly. Listen to this. I can, it must have been a bit of Irish. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. I think there was a wee bit of Irish there. He was praying like anything, Lord, don't let it rain. No, that wasn't his reason at all. That really wasn't the reason. He prayed earnestly because he was praying the heart of God. He was actually praying down uh, uh, that God would re do what he wanted to do. He was praying the prayers of God. You see, God had said if a land was full of idols and full of violence, he would withhold the rain in its due season. Now, there was a day when Elijah looked out over the land, and he thought, hey, this land has, the people have gone far away from God. It's a land full of violence. It's a land full of idols. So God said, I'll pray down the judgment of God. Now, many of us will pray for revival. Many of us will pray for blessing, and I hope we all do. But how many of us, now be honest here, how many of us would actually pray down the judgment of God upon a land? Now, when I worked in Africa, of course, the, the rainy season, if you don't get it well, you'll have a drought. And I said to the farmers one day, I said, you know, we really should sometimes pray the judgment of God upon this land. It's full of idols and uh, full of violence. And one of them said, I you're not a farmer. Don't you pray, pray. If you were a farmer, you'll not be praying like that. But I said, you know, Elijah, he prayed. He prayed the heart of God. He never wanted for one thing. He didn't lose out because he prayed that, that uh, against the violence and all. He didn't lose out when God did send judgment. In fact, God blessed him, and he was a blessing to others because he was in line with the heart of God. Now, sometimes we can pray our own praying. 
We need to know, God, what's throbbing on your heart? And God wants to share his burdens with us. When Abram, he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, well, I'm not going to hide that from Abram. I'm going to tell him what I'm going to do. He wanted someone to share it with. Are you in that place where God can share his burdens with you, where you can pray out what God has put on your heart and not be afraid to do it? Sometimes we're afraid to pray the prayers of God. Don't be afraid because you will be in the place of blessing and you, because God will bless you and you will become a blessing to others. Now, let's see these patterns uh, worked out uh, as we go through the, the chapters. Now, you can turn over to 1 Kings 17. And we're going to go through these chapters. Now, don't worry. I know in Africa our meetings can be six and seven hours. Yeah. But uh, we'll not have, unless the Lord breaks in, then you'll not care about anything else. <laughs> and we would love that. But uh, don't worry about it. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, look at it, before whom I stand. Now, just mark that little phrase, because you're going to hear it quite often in the next few chapters. He constantly says, the God before whom I stand. He was able to stand before God, so therefore he was able to stand before King Ahab, and he was able to give the word of the Lord. And he said, there'll be no, no uh, rain nor dew these years. Now listen to this. But according to my word, he didn't say according to the word of the Lord. No. He said according to my, what I say is going to go. Now the reason he had that confidence, his word was the word of the Lord. Some of us can say that. We have to say, thus saith the Lord. But if the Lord has said it, it is part of you. It becomes part of you. It's a pattern worked into your life that's going to be worked through it. And it was being worked into Elijah's life. So he wasn't afraid to stand before the king. And he delivers the word. And the word of the Lord came on to him, saying, that after he had given the pronouncement to Ahab, and the word of the Lord came on to Elijah, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward. Now, I have to smile when I read that. I said, Lord, you never would tell Marie McCarroll that, because I don't know east from west. I'm not a bit ashamed. Of they have tried to teach me. They have brought me out onto a field, and they have done this and that. I still don't know the east from the west. And when I worked in Canada, unfortunately, if you ask direction, they'll say you go so much far, and you turn east or you turn west. And after they have told me all of that, I look at them and I say, is that right or left? <laughs> because I have not a clue. Now, the Lord will always give us directions that we understand. He would never tell me to go east to west because he knows I'd end up in Timbuktu. So he tells us very directly. And that was the instructions he gave to Elijah. Now, this is what I want you to do. You've delivered the word of God. Now, I want you to go and turn eastward. Hide thyself by the brook of Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded, he had already done the commanding to the ravens, to bring you and feed, the ravens to feed you there. Now, I remember when I was visiting some of the Bible schools telling about our work, one girl came up to me afterwards and she said, Brie, like the Lord, I have to be truthful, the Lord's not really meeting my needs. She almost blamed the Lord. Well, I said to her, I want to ask you, I'll ask you a question. Are you at the right brook? 
If the Lord says he's going to feed you there, he's going to feed you there. And the only way you'll not be fed is if you've plundered off somewhere else where you shouldn't be. The Lord has already made the command to ravens to feed you there. And so he knew the word of the Lord. He had stood before the Lord. He had heard what God had said. And now he had moved out to do the bidding of God. Now he's by the brook. Now the ravens are bringing, there must have been some picture, the ravens were bringing him food and all the rest of it. And he was there for some time. Now, I can just imagine every day he would go down and he would drink off the brook. And as he went down to, to that brook, he would see the water was getting less and less and less. Now, I don't know about you, Sometimes our circumstances, we allow the circumstances to dictate to us instead of the word of God. Now, it was God that told him to go by the brook. Now the water's drying up. His mind starts to work and say, well, we're like, you better move out of here. Now, <clears throat> I, can, I, I can understand this because... One time when it, I was working in Africa, at the time in South Africa, and we, were, we did a mission with the Indian people, and the meetings were packed out and a number were saved. Then we moved from there up into another town uh, to, to work with the white people. We were going to have, we went around, we visited every home, we told them that we were going to be two weeks in the place and we were going to have two weeks meetings. Well. Everything went right, all right, as we thought, and we would get people out. And the first night, nobody came. Nobody. We thought, this is strange, but we prayed. Went around the next day, and we, oh, we got great talks and all the rest of it. Number two night, nobody came. Now, how would you like to put in a report that you'd put in every week? Nobody's coming to our meetings. <laughs> failure. That's what it's spelled. Failure. And my co-worker said to me, you know, Marie, don't you think after the week, first week, nobody had come, don't you think maybe we should move on? The Indian people down on the thing is, come on back to us and have another week. And uh, we, I said, no. So I said to my friend, well, why should we move? And she looked at me, she was a South African, she'd probably think, this stupid Irish woman, can't you see there's nobody coming? Why? Like, I mean, why must we keep on when nobody's coming? Well, I said, I'm asking myself the question, did God put us here or did he not? Did he not say we were to have two weeks meetings? All right. They're not coming, but we'll pray. So we spent the two weeks, and I'm sure a lot of evangelists would say, total failure. God is a bigger picture. God is a bigger plan. Keep in line with what God is saying. Elijah did that. When he saw the brook, he didn't allow his circumstances to it. He was waiting on something. He was standing before the Lord. And I can remember that so well because after that mission, I was sent up to work in Rhodesia, it's now Zimbabwe. And every single morning for the next four or five years, the Lord woke me up at three o'clock in the morning. And I prayed for that little time, Zizella. Now, there was four people that I had come in contact with, and it was the owner of the sugar mill uh, factory there and the assistant and their wives. So I was praying that the Lord would save them because they were the ones I met. After five years, I came back down to Natal to work, and uh, the folk in Natal in this little town, Cicella, they phoned me up one night and they said, Marie, we hear you're back again. Come, we you coming down to preach? I said, will anybody come? <laughs> and they said, oh, the Lord's really working here. So I went 
and I could, uh, the place was full. And who got saved that night? The four people I'd been praying for for the last four or five years. They were in the meeting and got wonderfully converted, opened up their homes and had Bible studies in it after we left. Isn't that great? You see, it, in our eyes, it was a failure. The report was nobody came to our wee mission. But the fact was, God told us to be there. That's why it's so important to stand before the Lord, to hear what God is saying. He's a speaking God, our God. He's not dumb. He speaks. And when he speaks, he is already at work, and things are happening. We don't have to always see what God's doing. But we do know he's doing something, and we're fitting into his plan. We can have that assurance. And Elijah waited, and you know what the Bible says? The brook dried up. He went down one morning, no water. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, You see, God is not slow. <laughs> Or we might think he is. We might think, well, like when there's a wee bit of water, why doesn't he just tell us to go? No. He tests us. He's working in us. He wants to work through us all of his good pleasure. Remember, he's making us more like our master. Remember, he, we're going to meet him one day. We're going to heaven. And heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. So we need to get ourselves ready. We need to get in line with God. We need to get to know him here so that it'll be wonderful when we see him. We'll be glad to see him. So Elijah listens, and then the next thing is, the Lord says to Elijah, now, you go I have, to a certain place. I ha Now listen to this. I have commanded a widow woman to feed you. Well, I don't know about you. I've been on the mission for a long time. And if the Lord told me, he was, he was sent me to somebody that was a widow and poor, I was, like, Lord, is there no millionaires in the place? Is there no real rich people around? Why send me to the poor to take more from them? That would be my little mind working. I'm just telling you exactly what I would think. The Lord knows anyway. So I was busy thinking, like, why? Why a widow woman? You see, the Lord had already blessed Elijah. Elijah was on track with God. And because he was blessed, he was becoming a blessing to ever he came in contact with. So he comes to the little widow woman, and he asks for a drink of water. Then he asks for, uh, for bread. And, and then when she was going to do it, he says, bring it to me first. Well, I don't think I would have had the neck to do that, but he did. He knew what he was doing. He was on track with God. And so the Lord instructed him, and now he was doing it. And the little woman, he said, it's all right, because you make for me, and that little, that little, the bread will not, never run out, and the oil will never run out. You'll always have plenty. That's exactly what he was saying to her. And so whenever... She went to do it. She brought it to him. And the little cruise and the little bar, it never, it was always full. All the time of the famine, she was being blessed by having the man of God in her home. And he was blessed by God, by doing what God was telling him to do. You can bring blessing to other people just by simply doing doesn't mean you'll always know, but by do, if you're blessed, you are a blessing. That's what the book says. If, you, if God blesses you, you are a blessing. You mightn't feel it, you mightn't know it, but you are, and God will work it all out in his own way. And so after a while, now he's with this little widow woman, and she had a son, and the son dies. Now this is tragedy, and it comes to us all whether we're walking with God or not. Tragedy will come, different circumstances will come our way, but remember this, 
always remember that I have learned to say, I don't say now, I used to say, well, what's this all about, Lord? I just say, Lord, show me yourself in this. Because the, the wonderful thing is a revelation of God. God, in every circumstance, wants to reveal himself to you. And so when you find God in it, uh, all the other things fit into place. But it's getting to know God. That's the whole purpose of everything. There's, it's not just a haphazard thing that comes in. Nothing can come near me. It has to bypass him first. And so whatever comes my way, it's for something. Now, in it, he says, I'll never leave you. Well, if he's not going to leave me, he's there around me. So, Lord, help me to see you in this. And he will reveal himself to you. Now, this, this son dies, and so uh, Elijah goes and he takes the, the, the son, brings him into his, his room, and he, re, he re stretches himself upon the child. And the thought came to me, the dead always need the embracing of the living. The spiritually dead need the embracing of the living. So if we are alive unto God, dead unto self, some people are always dying, but they never die. I'm one of those sickly ones that's always dying, but I never seem to die. Everybody goes before me that is as healthy as can be, and I'm still hanging around. But the fact is, Dead unto self. And people can talk about that. Oh, I, yes, I need to die to self. We need to die. But alive unto God. That's only part of it. Yes, die to self. Have finished with the old life. But alive, very much alive unto God. That's what he requires of us. That's what he wants from us. So he takes the dead. And he embraces it, but he prays to the living God. Lord, only God, not even a prophet, can give life to a dead body. It was the God of heaven, and he had to appeal to the God of heaven. And he knew that only the God of heaven could restore life into this boy. And God brings him to life. God brings the boy to life. And he get now, and this is the interesting part. And uh, the uh, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Isn't that wonderful? You say, "Well, he's supposed to." Also. But the the Lord heard the voice of Elijah because Elijah was always hearing his voice. And so the two now, one knows the other. And isn't it wonderful that this wonderful God knows us? He knows us through and through. So there's no point in lying to him. You know, some people will come to the Lord, oh, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. And in the middle of it all, they think, I'm sure it is. This, this is a real tangle of things. I don't know. The Lord can do certain things, but he can't de definitely do this. The Lord can heal the sick, but raise the dead. Mm-mm. There's nothing, nothing that God can do. But he doesn't always do it because he's got a plan. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And he, everything fits into that plan and into that purpose to bless us. That's what he wants to do, to bless us. But we need to keep re moving into the will of God. Now, the woman then says, after he, she gets her son, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. What you're saying about God and, and the promises of God is true. Now, I can stand here from now to doomsday telling you they're true, but you have got to receive them for yourself. You've got to find out for yourself. And the only way you'll do that is standing before the Lord, hearing the word of God, and allowing that word to work in and out of your life. 
Then there came, comes, and I have to go quickly through this, the next chapter, it reveals now nah, the Lord, it, it's time to meet with the king again. It's time to let him know that God, now, nah, Elijah had prayed the heavens closed. Now nah, he's going to pray that the rain comes down. But he's going to prove to the nation, a nation, not just a wee group of people, a whole nation, who God really is. And if he is who he says is, he should be serving him. And so he orders the king, in the chapter, if you go through the chapter, he orders the king to bring the prophets of Baal up onto the mountain, and he orders the king up onto the mountain, and he orders the nation up onto the mountain. Why, this man had got authority. And the Lord gives us that authority. And so off he goes, and they all come up onto the mountain. And so Elijah addresses, and he says, if Baal is really God, serve him. But if the Lord is God, serve him. Now, how we're going to know is the God who sends the fire out of the heavens and consumes the sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal, they provided the sacrifices and they got their, theirs all ready, and they cried all morning until noon, and their God never answered because he was no God. He was no God. They cut themselves. They squealed onto the Lord. Onto, onto the uh, bow, but no fire came out of heaven. Then it was Elijah's turn. He was a man who was in for orders and out for service, and now he stands before them. He puts the, uh, the, the, the sacrifice on the altar. First of all, he mends what is broken, and that's one thing. We need to mend. God allows us to mend. He, may, he can mend, but sometimes we've also got to put our hands to the plow and do certain things. He mended that which was broken, the altar. He put the stones in order for the, the 12 stones. Then he put the sacrifice on, bit by bit. And then he drew near, and he said, Lord, send fire, that the people may know that you are God and that I do all of these things according to your word. He wasn't just up there to show, oh, I'm going to put on a big show here. No, he was doing everything according to the word of the Lord. And he prayed a simple prayer. The fire fell out of the heavens, consumed the sacrifice. To even told him to put water on it. That was to let them know there was no tricks in this. There was nothing tricky. And everything was for real. And that sacrifice in the wood shouldn't have been consumed, but it was because it was God's fire. God's got a fire, you know. You should do a wee study on God's fires. It's really interesting. But anyway, he burns it all up and mix up all the water. And not only did the fire fall, the people fell. And they proclaimed, God, he is God. Let the people know that the God that you have got, that the God you say you serve, the God that you worship week after week, is the living God. He's not just any person. He's the living God. He's your creator, the one who speaks, and when he speaks, things do happen. And now he said, now, nah, all of this is going to rain. <laughs> After all of that, it's going to rain. And he gets down and he starts to pray for the rain. He sends his servant out, and he looks, and he sees nothing. But after the seventh time, he goes, it's a wee cloud, only the size of a man's hand, though nothing much. And then he tells him, get down, there's going to be an abundance of rain. 
You see, the man of God knew the heart of God. We need to know his heart. And he kept in touch with God. But now something happens that turns the man of God away from God. He gets a, a, a word from Jezebel. Jezebel, Ahab went home and told him all the things that Elijah had done and how that he had slaughtered the, the prophets of Baal. And the minute she heard that, she sent a message to Elijah. And she said, I'm going to get you and I'm going to kill you. Now, <clears throat> the Bible says the minute he heard that, now, this is what was happening to him. And it can happen to any one of us. He heard another voice that brought another message. And that other message made him run out of, what go off, completely off track. It's the other voice. The minute you start listening to other voices, and those voices can say many things. They could say to you, uh, whatever night your prayer meeting is, or oh, don't go tonight. There's not very many goes, and what, they won't miss you for one night. And or maybe you come in, ouch, <coughs> of us. I've got a real cold. I don't think I should go to the prayer meeting. You haven't got a real cold at all. You only sneeze and you don't want to go. Why don't you just tell the Lord I don't want to go? He knows anyway you don't want to go because he knows your heart. Lord, I don't want to go. But Lord, will you put it in my heart to want to go? And he'll do it. He'll do it. But there's voices that come that keep us from knowing and doing God's best. And sometimes that voice overrides. Now, Elijah, all, he had done miracles. He had seen miracles. He had been in tune with God. But now another voice with another message comes in, and he listens to it. And you know what happens? He starts running. And he doesn't know where he's running. He just runs. Now, that can happen to any one of us. The minute we, we get another message and fear comes into our lives, the Lord, in the midst of a, of a difficulty, the Lord has said, I'll never leave you, I'm not forsaking you. Oh, I'm not waiting around here to find out if the Lord is going to be here. I'm going. And that's exactly what Elijah did. He ran, and he got off track. He ran into the wilderness, and he, the, the Lord even provided food for him and a good night told him to go to sleep and, and he woke again. And, he, and then the minute he got up, all he could think of was, his life's in danger, I must go. And off he went again. Then he gets himself caged in. He goes to a cave and he dwells in a cave when all the other time he would roam the countryside when he said all kinds of things when, to Ahab about what he was doing, and yet he wasn't afraid. But now this other message is going over in his mouth. It wasn't God's message. Now, I know what that fear can be. I was in a, prob uh, in a place, well, I am a problem anyway, but I was in this place where I got myself into a problem and forever get myself into trouble. And I always remember Mr. Govan said to me once, I said to him, he said, you know, Marie, you shouldn't have been there. And you'll get yourself into trouble. I said, don't worry about me. I've got a guardian angel. And he looked at me and said, what? Your guardian angel was in a hospital long ago with a nervous breakdown, so you can forget about that. So I don't, don't know. I'm, I don't know if I got out of hospital yet or not. But anyway, but I always know the Lord's with me, and the Lord was with Elijah. And I remember on this particular occasion, I got into a problem with a witch doctor, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it. But after it. it I had to start a, to stop a, a fight that was going on in the town, and the Lord enabled me to do it. I was scared to death, but anyway, the Lord enabled me to do it. And this witch doctor said to me, 
I'll get you for that. Well, I'll be truthful. I'd rather a bullet go through me than a witch doctor get after me uh, because they do all kinds of weird and wonderful things. So I was sort of backing off. And the Lord said to me, why are you backing off? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in her, or he that is in the world. So why are you backing off? So the Lord at that particular moment gave me the courage I needed, and I looked at him and I said, back off. And then the next words, don't ask me where they came from. I can only say they came from above, because I never in my wildest dream would have said this. I said, I'm indestructible. <laughs> Until the day God says time's up, you'll not tell me when my time's up. Now, she did try a few tricks on me, but it didn't work because I sent them back where they came from. So, you see, you, you can't be fair. And I don't blame, Elijah was overwhelmed by this fear. But the strange thing was, he was running away from death because he, uh, uh, Jezebel was going to kill him. But it was the strangest thing, because when he was under the juniper tree, he said, Lord, let me die. That was his prayer. Why didn't he just stay where he was? And Jezebel wouldn't have got him. But he, he, he was praying even prayers that he wouldn't have prayed of normally. And that's what we can do. We can pray all kinds of things that are not right, we can do all kinds of things that are not right. So here was, he was totally off track. And any one of us can get off track. Just see that you don't. But here's the wonderful thing. God didn't let him go. Ah, that's lovely. Because the Lord just came to me and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And otherwise you shouldn't be here. And Elijah said, well, I've been very spiritual. I've been very good. I only am left. I have preached your word. I have done all that was right. And now that I even seek my life. And then finally God comes to him in a wonderful way. And what he says, Elijah, stand before me. In other words, get back to where you were. And you know, he thought that was the end of his ministry. He thought that was the end of everything. It was the end of his life. It, everything was gloom and doom. But God had wonderful things ahead. It was, well, he didn't answer his prayer, dying under an old juniper tree. Oswald Chambers says, juniper trees make poor sanctuaries. So imagine dying there when he, the Lord was already preparing chariots of fire and horsemen to bring him into heaven. That would be more, more like Elijah, wouldn't it? The man of fire going up in the fire. But here he was, doom and gloom, under the, and maybe that's the part you have got today. Maybe for a long time you've been walking with God. You've been in for, uh, in for orders and you've been out for service. You've been going on well with God and then suddenly something comes. Another message comes into your head another voice you're listening to. Get rid of it. Hear again the voice of God, and it will say to you, get back to where you came from. Stand before me. And the minute you do that, which Elijah did, he stood before the Lord. And when he stood before the Lord again, the Lord gave him instructions. He had to anoint uh, two kings, he had anointed a prophet, and he still had a job to do. But he had to get and stand before the Lord. Wherever you are today in life's journey, make sure on your journey that you're standing before God. You're in to hear what God is saying. Remember, he's a speaking God. And let him speak and then respond to him. And by doing exactly what he wants you to do, going out and performing what he's asked you to do. Maybe he's asked you to be a Sunday school teacher. Maybe he's asked you to be a leader. I know one thing, he'll never ask me to sing. 
unless he gives me the voice for it. <laughs> but she went around everywhere looking for singing, and she didn't ask me. <laughs> I was all cut about that. <laughs> not a bit of it. <laughs> because I know where the Lord has put me, and I'll not go outside that zone because I'll be on my own big time. So I stay within the zone God has called me to do. And even though I've shaken my shoes and I've thanked the Lord a hundred times when I sit down there for another miracle, but it is a miracle. And the Lord can work miracles through you, and you'll see miracles. You can't walk with God and not see a miracle, but never be taken up with a miracle. That's God. Whatever he does in and through you, it's grace and it's love and it's mercy and it's the power of God flowing in you to flow out to others to bring glory and honor to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. So today, on the journey of life, where do you stand? Are you going in for orders? Are you hearing the voice of God? Are you going out to serve him the way he wants? Are you in that place where you want to hear the heartbeat of God so that you can pray God's prayers? Let him breathe into you what he wants you, his burdens, his desires, his longings. And it hasn't to be all your longings, all your desires. What does he want? What does your maker want? What does he long for you? What does he want you to do? You have a task that nobody else in us is not going to give to anybody. Else. He wants you to do it. And you say, well, I can't do very much. Well, there's something you can do. And you tell me you're too old, I'll throw something at you because there's none of us too old to do. And God has always got a job for us. He might change it a little as we get older and give us a lighter task. He's killing me this last two weeks, but anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> I, a while back, you see, that's another thing, is standing before the Lord. I'd given up preaching for a while because I felt that that was what God wanted, and I enjoyed my time with the Lord then. But then the Lord said, now, really, I want you back in. So I said, well, that's all right, Lord. I, I think I can manage that. But four meetings a month, no more, because that's all I think, feel I can take. I've got a hundred and one things wrong with me. So I felt in my body that that's what I could take. So religiously, I did those. Well, anybody ask outside that for me? No, I'm sorry, I can't take it. I might take it another time, but not in with these four meetings. Well, a few months ago, the Lord said, Marie, throw that measuring rod away. Listen to me and do what I want you to do. Not what you think you can do. What, not what you think your body can do. Not what, what, what. Just do what I want you to do. So he gave me four meetings in two days and nearly killed me out. But I said, all right, Lord, if you want to wreck me, if you want to take me home, that's all right. You see, and he didn't. In fact, I went to take a help out in a mission just recently, and I had the, I'd got out of bed because of the real, I had the flu. But I was getting over, but I had this cough, and I said to the lady that took me, I'll be barking at the people instead of preaching to them. Cough, 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 cough. Not once did I cough during those two meetings. You see, the Lord, if he asks you, he's going to be there with you. There's nothing to doubt. And even if you have to get into bed a wee bit earlier, that's all right, sure. He'll get you a wee bit of rest for the next meeting that he wants you to do. But whatever he saith unto you, that's the important issue. Not what you want to do, not what you think you should do, not your brilliant ideas. I've got brilliant, I can get brilliant ideas. But, but a wee verse keeps coming to my mind. You know what it is? Jesus said it. I only do the things the Father tells me to do. And those are the important things. It might be just to go and visit a neighbor. It might be to bake a cake and take it to someone. It might be something, but whatsoever he says to you, 
Get in for orders. Lord, you're going to speak to me. You're a speaking God. Say something. And he will. And you'll hear it. And then go out. There's no use of asking the Lord, Lord, what's your will for my life if you're not going to do it? You might as well keep quiet. But if you really want to do the will of God and you want to get to know God better, that's how you get. That book is a revelation of who God really is. Get to know the book. Get to know the Christ of the book. And then stand before him and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And then go out to do what he wants you to do. Amen.